Right, so I'm going to talk about a bit of a background as to why we've, we started with this initiative in South Africa. And it really, it's, I call it promoting safety and su sustainability. Um, so it's, we, this, this whole presentation and this workshop today is about safety and sustainability. So it's about safety on the roads. How can we improve safety on the roads? We know of the, the problems that we have in South Africa with a very high fatality rate and crashes and the impact on congestion, etc. And then sustainability. So when I talk about sustainability, I'm referring to sustainability of the road infrastructure. So one of the, the initial reasons why we started this initiative was to reduce heavy vehicle overloading to extend the life of the road network because those of us who are involved in transport and others realize the critical importance of a road network in a country like South Africa for moving our freight around. But it's also about sustainability of road transport operators. And um, I should actually mention, where's Bonner? Has he gone out for... He's just gone out. We've got a very special guest with us today, uh, Bonner Goodhart from, from Amsterdam. Um, and he's part of the Smart Freight Center. And we've, we've been running a course for the last two days in Kempton Park uh, called the Smart Transport Managers Training Course. Uh, it's a two-day course, and we're running it again tomorrow and Friday um, as a pilot. It's the first time we're running it in South Africa. And it's about providing training for transport operators to be more sustainable. And the reason why, Adrian will talk about it a bit later, but the reason why the RTMS is partnering with the Smart Freight Center in Amsterdam is to promote sustainability. Um, and the RTMS is about that as well. It's about providing a framework for transport operators that they can run their businesses in a sustainable way. Because there are too many operators, and I'll show you some statistics now, that if you look at what's happening on our roads, <clears throat> vehicles that are not maintained, speeding, overloading, all these things that people think this is the way to do business, this is the way to make profits quickly, but in fact it's not sustainable. So RTMS and the PBS project, which we'll <clears throat> also talk about today, is about managing risk. Risk on the roads is, it can, can sink your business if you don't manage risk. It's also about promoting compliance and increasing productivity. So as I said, a high standard of um, road infrastructure is critical if we want to have efficient road transport and safety. Now South Africa has got a very high standard of infrastructure. If you look at our primary road network, for example, that's managed by Sanral, we've really got a a high quality uh, road network. It, um, I always say to people, I can drive from here to Durban, I probably won't see a single pothole. I can drive from here to Cape Town, I probably won't see a single pothole. There are not ma many countries in the world that, that have such a good road network. Of course, there are other parts of the network that are not so good, but there, South Africa, we actually do very well. We also want minimum incidents and crashes, including <coughs> breakdowns. Because incidents and crashes affect the efficiency of the road network, especially in metropolitan areas like Johannesburg, Durban, Cape Town. So if you're having crashes on the road every day, it affects your, the whole uh, efficiency of your transport uh, industry. Compliance with road traffic regulations. I mean, I don't have to say anything about that in South Africa. We have a huge amount of non-compliance. Um, safety and security, efficient res emergency response. If there is an, uh, an incident or an, a crash, we want to have an um, efficient emergency response, A, to help the people that are injured, and B, to get the road, uh, the, the capacity going again, and then, of course, seamless cross-border transit. So the first bullet point on that slide, we, we do very well. We can give ourselves a big tick, but the rest, in South Africa, we, we don't do well at all, if you compare us with other countries. So here's just a clip um, uh, of a incident. <clears throat> the problem is that 
crashes are inve inevitable, but the frequency of crashes in South Africa is just unacceptable. And besides the, the fatalities and serious injuries that are usually associated with crashes like this, it's the, the impact on the, the road network. So you can have a very high standard road network with four lanes in each direction, like the R21, for example. But if you're having crashes every second day, your, your infrastructure, your investment in infrastructure is almost nullified because those lanes are closed um, so much of the time. And that's, the, that's the pro one of the big problems we face in South Africa. If you talk about the road network, we do have a good road, primary road network, but we also have some serious problems with some of the lower order roads. And this has a big impact on um, vehicle operating costs. So some, some work that was done at the CSIR and at the University of Pretoria show that <clears throat> this is now on actual vehicle Main, repair and maintenance costs. These are actual costs. And they classified the roads that these trucks were using as either good, fair, or bad. And you can see there's a 121% increase in repair and maintenance costs if you go from operating your vehicles on a good road to a bad road. So that's a big increase uh, and effect on your bottom line as a transport operator. So as an industry, it's very important, it's in our interest that we have a good road network. This doesn't even take into account damage to fruit, for example. Uh, Yapi Berger from ZZ2 uh, is going to be presenting just now. And so if, you, if you're transporting uh, um, sensitive uh, products like fruit or vegetables, it, bad roads will, will have a bad impact on your quality of your product. Uh, vehicles. We also have challenges in South Africa with, with vehicles not being compliant. Now, I'm, I've been involved, and Kathy as well, in the Break and Tire Watch initiative that was initiated by Fleetwatch. Fleetwatch have a table out there um, in the foyer. And up to, up to now, we've had, there's been 42 uh, Break and Tire Watch training events. It's a two-day training event for traffic officers to improve their capacity to do law enforcement specifically on brakes and tires of heavy vehicles. And um, this is not all of them, that's just uh, some of them that have, that have been taken place. Um, the next one in fact is in Vintuk in May. Uh, the last one was in, at Donkohuk in outside Pretoria. And on the first day there are lectures by industry experts on brakes and tires and a few other things. Uh, there's normally between 60 and 120 traffic officers that attend the course. On day two, it's a practical, and the, we go to a vehicle testing center, and trucks are pulled off the road and inspected, and defects are, the, the, the experts look for the defects to show the traffic officers what to look for. Uh, I don't know if, if anyone who's not involved in these uh, initiative can guess what the the percentage failure rate, percentage of trucks discontinued from use, of the 745 trucks that have been inspected. Any any guess? 80 per, what? 80 percent. That's a bit harsh. 69 percent of all those trucks that were inspected were <coughs> discontinued from use, and we've got. There are thousands of photographs of defects. So this shows a, a roller brake tester where you can see on the left-hand photo there's braking on the left-hand wheel but no braking on the right-hand wheel. This is very common. So you'll have an axle and on the one side there's braking, there's brakes, on the other side there's no brakes. There are many cases where a whole, the whole trailer is there's no brake at all, where the, the, the braking is being relied on on the truck tractor. Uh, gaps between brake linings and drums. So on the left-hand side is what it should look like. On the right-hand side, you've got two cases where there's 10 or 15 millimeter gap between the lining and the, um, the brake drum. That means there's no brakes when he applies brakes, or the lining's gone, or the, even the brake shoe's gone. Um, on the left-hand side, there's 
no booster, sorry, on the right hand side, there's no brake booster, it's been removed. So that means that wheel has got no brakes at all. Um, there is some hope though. So in Johannesburg, um, the brake testing has got quite strict. <laughs> Wheel nuts, often missing wheel nuts. Uh, the one we had, at, one that we had at midway, the officer was able to take those two wheel nuts off with his hand. They were so loose. Tires often in very bad condition. I think that's one of the the biggest problems in in terms of cause of truck crashes is tires that burst or um, it's it's really tire management and it's not just about safety. It's also about costs. You know, if your tires are not probably properly managed, your fuel consumption goes up. That's what we've been talking about the last couple of days. How do you bring fuel consumption down and bring down emissions? Um, tires are very, very important to manage. Um, load securement also is, is sometimes not what it should be. Don't know where these guys got their training. Um, but yeah, crashes. This was on the N1 Pretoria, Rigel Avenue, the famous hill. And this was in the northbound lane, but it was the day before the Easter weekend. So it affected <coughs> that whole four lanes going north was closed for 13 hours. So all the buses that go north to Limpopo for the Easter weekend had to be diverted. Thousands of buses and other vehicles had to be diverted through the city of Pretoria because the N1 was closed for 13 hours. That is a, that's a disaster. Um, this is stats from an OECD project in which I was involved. And you can see this is fatal crash rates per 100 million kilometers. And they had to actually have a special graph because South Africa's statistics was way out of line compared to other uh, OECD member countries. So Switzerland the lowest line is one fatality, one fatal crash per 100 million kilometers. And we're sitting around about 10. So the, it, it is a problem. Uh, here on the N3, the, queues, the, the vehicle queues were 30 kilometers long. Town Hill in Peter Maritzburg on the N3, the N3 uh, frequently it's a long downhill and frequently there are brake failures or crashes, lanes are closed and the trucks are waiting. So it it's, has a, a, quite a significant impact on the economy if it's happening on such a frequent basis. Because remember, your fleet might be well maintained, but your truck might be sitting somewhere up there. It's not your fault, but you delayed. So the more f crashes we have and the more delays we have um, in the country, it affects everyone. All the operators that are using this route are affected because someone's um, been irresponsible, reckless driving, hasn't maintained their vehicle. So it's in our interest to promote compliance across the board. So these, these, um, some of these things I've described, overloading, poor vehicle fitness, we'll talk about driver fitness in quite depth, some depth today, um, reckless driver behavior, etc. Bribery and corruption is a, is a cancer that undermines the efforts of the road authorities to get better compliance because it allows certain operators to per persist with their, um, their illegal behavior. And those vehicles, whether it's brakes or overloading or speeding, are likely to cause a crash at some time in the future because they're not being stopped from their um, illegal behavior. So bribery and corruption is a big problem for, our, for the safety and and productivity on our road networks. But the outputs are poor road safety, high costs of road transport, deterioration of the infrastructure as a result of overloading, and high levels of emissions. And that's not good for the country. So um, I think I'll skip through this slide. It just gives some of the effects of, of non-compliance on vehicle operations. But um, this is the RTMS board that you see on the right-hand side. As I say, it, it started in 2003. We put a committee together, um, and it was came out of a, 
the national overload control strategy that the CSIR did for the National Department of Transport. And there were all this, the um, traditional approaches of building more way bridges, um, tightening up on legislation, training more traffic officers, etc., etc. But we had come across a self-regulation project or initiative in Australia called the National Heavy Vehicle Accreditation Scheme. And we put that in as a recommendation. Why don't we look at the possibility of promoting self-regulation, voluntary compliance, as a maybe or as an accreditation scheme perhaps in South Africa? And those days, you know, most of us thought, no, it's, I can't see it working here in South Africa. But we started with, uh, we put a, a committee together. We had the opportunity to start in the forestry industry with a lot of support from Mondi and Sapi. And, um, and so you can see in 2007 there were 74 certified vehicles. And in fact now it's, in fact it's over 17,000 um, trucks and buses that are participating in the scheme. There you can see an overview of the, the overload control strategy. And right in the middle is the, a summary, well it's just an indication of where we proposed that we should look at self-regulation and also at performance-based standards, which uh, we'll talk about a bit later, high-capacity vehicles. There's the um, Australian example of the tra Australian scheme, and the one on the right is the, the South African National Standard, Road Transport Management System, SANS 3095, and Oliver, the next presentation, will go into detail about what the requirements are of the standard so if you're an operator and you want to be certified, you need to get the standard, you need to go through the requirements and basically do a gap analysis because most operators will be complying with, with a number of the standards, the requirements of the standard, but inevitably I don't think we've come across a single operator that is 100% compliant right from the start. So you need to do a bit of a gap analysis to see where in your transport business are you not meeting the requirements of the standard and then you need to put some processes and um, policies in place. So this is just an overview which Oliver will go into in more detail but it, it covers loading, it covers safety and compliance, it covers driver wellness where we've had huge uh, positive feedback from operators where they've paid more attention to driver wellness and the positive um, benefits in terms of their operating costs and then general support. Um, so as far as the RTMS goes, we, we identified three key elements in road transport, namely the road infrastructure, the vehicles and the drivers. And as I said, the initial initiative was to try and reduce overloading. That was why we started the project. It was just about protecting the road infrastructure. But as we've rolled out the project, the major benefits that we've identified have been improved as a result of improved vehicle maintenance, particularly trailers that were not being done as in accordance to sort of minimum standards. And then, as I said just now, driver health or driver wellness. It's just driver training, it's um, their health and it's managing fatigue. The, the Department of Transport has supported the project over the years and um, you can see in the road freight strategy there's a pillar. The fourth pillar there is, is about self-regulation and road safety. Here's a, a workshop that we had up in Polokwane a few years ago and that's the Deputy Minister of Transport. She was, she was the Deputy Minister of Transport then and she is the Deputy Minister of Transport now. I think since then we've had four ministers, um, but this was in Galulu Bulk getting their RTMS certificate. We don't have any certificates to hand out today, but at the last workshop, which was at Coca-Cola South Africa, we handed out, I think, six, six certificates to various operators that had got their certification. This was a, a function down in Nelspruit, uh, Bus Corps, <coughs> and there, the, <coughs> excuse me, the previous Minister of Transport, as well as the MEC for Transport, attended the function, and then we had one in Cape Town for Golden Arrow Bus Services. Um, we also had the Minister of Transport, and in the background there is the the MEC for Transport in the Western Cape, Donald Grant. So. Um, 
I'll just the last bit, I just want to share a couple of short case studies, but today we will be having a number of case studies from various operators. Um, this was where the project started, and that blue line is the percentage of overloading in the, for in the forestry industry, and we're talking about pulp and paper, so it's basically in KwaZulu-Natal and Mpumalanga. When we started and measuring the, the, the vehicle masses and overloads at the destinations, in other words, at the pulp mill, so you get a 100% sample. Not like at the Weybridges, the, the law enforcement Weybridges, you'll probably only cover five, less than 5% of, say, trucks carrying timber because of all the different routes and the, the operational hours of the Weybridges. You don't get close to a, a, a big sample. When we started, 30, just around about 30% of all timber trucks were overloaded, delivering timber to the pulp mills. And if you look, uh, you can't probably see the numbers, but since, since early 2015, we've been hovering between 1% and 2% overloading in the forestry industry. So that's four years now. Getting data up to 25,000 trips a month in the forestry industry. That's, that's the amount of uh, transport. And there, are still, uh, there is still a bit of overloading, but it's significantly improved from what it was in 2003. Um, and there's a similar, I don't know if I've got it here. No, I haven't got it here, but there's a similar graph for the sugar industry, where also when they started, we, the, ben, the baseline was 32% overloading in, in, with sugar cane. And for the last three years, it's been below 1%. Um, less than 1% of the sugarcane trucks are overloaded. So there's a significant contribution to extending the life of the road network. Um, the city of Cape Town at this stage is still only the, gov the only government fleet that's RTMS certified, which is a pity. We, we really would like to get more government fleets involved. But this is now their electricity support services. And um, without going into too much detail, they have a fleet of about nine, 900 vehicles, some big trucks, but a lot of the smaller aerial platform cranes for doing uh, repairs and maintenance to support electricity. And when they started on this, this journey, sorry, um, only 65% of their fleet were available. Um, and they've, they've, they've increased it to 90, almost 93%. So they did a whole lot of an analysis of their fleet, which is one of the requirements of implementing the RTMS, um, looking at stock replacement cycle. They improved it from 33 years to between 8 and 15 years. Functional alignment, they improved from 40% to 85%. Fleet availability up to 92%. And service schedule att attainment, servicing the vehicles at the required intervals, was only 47% and they improved that to 98%. So those are some of the improvements that were implemented over a, from 2005 to 2016. Now you can see some of the benefits in terms of fuel consumption. <coughs> the average fuel consumption improved by 24%. That's a huge improvement in terms of cost savings. Uh, six, six, about six million savings a year carbon footprint down by 24%, cost savings on repairs and maintenance, um, 4.2 million in the 2016 financial year. And then there, there's a, one of the key elements of the RTMS is, is collecting data and monitoring, but then taking some action. So a lot of companies get a lot of data from various sources about the, the operation of their fleets but they don't really evaluate that data and they don't take any corrective action. And that's one of the, that you've got to take it to that further step and then you start to see benefits. So you can see that um, monitoring traffic violations, this is city of Cape Town, um, fleet incidents, and then identifying what are the problems, for example, in the traffic violations. And Oliver, but Oliver will talk about that a bit more. Um, proactive maintenance, compliance, and then uh, Danny Diedrichs is here from, she's now SA Fleet. She's developed a fleet management system. And, but she used to work for Dawn Logistics, which had 13 depots around the country. They became certified, and it's, it's a fantastic uh, example as well of um, 
You can see there their fines from 2013 to 2017 decreased from 218 down to 46. This is with a fleet going from about 200 to 260 vehicles over that period. So it's a fairly large fleet. Um, crashes, 37 down to 20. Driver error crashes, 19 reducing down to four or five. And then breakdowns, also significant uh, reductions. Monitoring speeding of the trucks using the telematics and then having uh, a definition for a speeding incident. It's not necessarily over 80 kilometers an hour. It could be over 85 for one minute or there are different ways of defining a speeding event. But in 2014, they had over 60,000 speeding events for their fleet of 201 vehicles. And in 2017, it was down to just under 5,000 or 19 per vehicle per year. And that represents a huge improvement in risk management. If you can bring, speeding is a big contributor to crashes and also for increasing fuel consumption. So managing speeding has some significant benefits. Now in terms of their fuel consumption, um, you can see from 2013 up to 2017, they had a reduction in <coughs> fuel consumption or an improvement of 23%. And that, that is, they attributed to good maintenance processes and driver behavior. So re eliminating or reducing speeding, reducing harsh braking, harsh acceleration, basically green band driving. You can save a lot of money um, through imp uh, driver training. ZZ2, well, Yap is going to be talking Vehicle delivery service is an example of monitoring speed violations. And then a lot of the companies, and these, these statistics go back to the, uh, 2009 or so, to, to 2012, um, a lot of the fleets came back, have shown evidence of significant reduction in crashes and incidents as a result of implementing um, the RTMS. And then one of the areas regarding drivers is more qualitative, um, which has also been a significant feedback, and I'm sure it'll come through in some of the case studies today, where um, reduction in turnover of drivers, improved standard of living of drivers, um, improvement in driver wellness, um, reduction in breakdowns because of drivers reporting breakdown, etc. So there's been a lot of um, positive feedback from operators who've seen uh, improvements in their drivers, attitude, um, et cetera. So if you think about compliance on the roads, specifically in heavy vehicles, I think we can uh, fairly confidently say that definitely more than 50% of the vehicles, heavy vehicles on the road are not compliant. And that's not just vehicle fitness. The statistics I gave from the brake and tire watch, but it's also, if you look at speeding, overloading, etc. And uh, law enforcement has a very small impact, unfortunately, in South Africa on, on getting compliance, achieving compliance. So we can't rely on law enforcement to solve this problem. And the idea of, of the, one of the purposes of RTMS, besides improving productivity, is to, to get that vertical line to move it more to the right to get more people on the road to be compliant vol voluntarily and it will be of, to everyone's benefit. So this is a book that was published by Fleetwatch which gives quite a lot uh, more in detail about the RTMS but um, that's basically an introduction to um, what are the problems on the road and what the role of the RTMS can be in trying to address some of these problems. So thanks very much.